There are four parts to this talk, though one part is much meatier than the rest and is really what I primarily want to focus on. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the state of the referendum, quote, race, unquote. You'll see the reasons for the quotation marks in the moment. Um, but I don't intend to spend hours arguing speculatively about who's ahead and which polls are right. Um, the second bit, which is what I want to focus on particularly, because this is the question of what is the referendum all about for voters, is to look at, well, what are the social and ideological divisions that underlie this referendum? Who are the voters who are more likely to vote for Remain and for Leave? What are the key arguments that appear to incline them in one direction or another? And in a sense, therefore, to discover, well, what really is this referendum about? What questions actually is, Scotland, is, is Britain settling beyond the particular uh, wording on the ballot paper? Having then talked about that, I need to talk a little bit about the geography of the referendum, and that's the point where Scotland kicks in, um, and also a little bit about the politics of it, the implications of political parties. And then, as it were, coming towards the end and kind of thinking forward a little bit about what might happen in the two weeks or so that are left, just to talk a little bit about you know, the prospects for who's going to turn out on the day, and the question of whether or not, at the end of the day, risk-averse voters will decide that maybe it's better to hang on to the nurse whose medicine they've already tasted as opposed to taking something from the doctor from whom they've not currently had any interaction. Anyway, OK. Um, this is one of the uh, things you can find on my website. This is literally a graphical representation of the uh, now 140-odd published opinion polls of voting intentions in the referendum that have taken place since last September when uh, the, the government and the Electoral Commission agreed on the referendum question. Um, there are a few characteristics of this to take on board. If you haven't got it, the blue line is remain and the green line is leave. The first thing you should note is that clearly in more polls than not, the blue line is above the green line. Remain or ahead. I should say, by the way, in this and in everything else I'm going to present you with, the don't knows are taken out. All right. now, in other words, we're now really looking at what the polls are actually anticipating as to what the outcome of the referendum might be now and uh, ignoring the fact that some people don't know. This is simply the standard practice in, in uh, general elections, and I never understand when it comes to referendums. People just don't do the same thing. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the chart a little more carefully, you might remind you a little bit of the um, printout of a heart patient who's in a wee bit of trouble. <laughs> there are occasional flickers of life, and then apparently it's all gone again. The flickers of life, and I should say you should not read any partisan implications into this, the flickers of life are the telephone polls. Because one of the things that we know about this referendum is that the telephone polls have tended to put uh, the uh, uh, Remain side further ahead. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. So all of a sudden we get these big leads for, for Remain. And they disappear again. And indeed, what, of course, you will notice, you know, if I were to get a statistician, but I don't need a statistician to do this, if I get a statistician and say, please draw me the best straight line that summarises this, this data, he will say, I don't need a computer to do that. I simply draw a straight line parallel to the horizontal axis, and it's absolutely flat. In other words, the remarkable thing about this referendum, leaving aside the uncertainty created by the opinion polls, because they can't quite agree, but the remarkable thing apparently about this referendum is that actually virtually nothing has happened to the balance of opinion, which is certainly a bit of a problem for journalists. It occasionally gets the city traders into a lather when all of a sudden opinion polls seem to be saying something different. And shall we say, for those of us who are trying to write a website and write the odd occasional thousand words, it can also be a bit of a problem too, but there we go. Now, even if we 
smooth out the data. Uh, and this is one of the things I've been doing, just running a r- rolling average of the last six opinion polls. Again, you kind of see what occasionally it kind of winds and then it narrows again, but there is absolutely no trend. And indeed, if you actually look at now the two kinds of polls separately, so the blue bars show you the percentage share for Remain taking out the don't knows, and the, R- and the, blue, blue, for, the percentage for Remain in the telephone polls, so with the don't knows taken out, leave is there for 100 minus whatever figure is there, and the orange lines, assuming you're orange or dark red or however you want to look at it, it's orange in front of me and it's red there, um, the, those are the figures for remain on average in the phone polls. And I simply divided the referendum into four periods. The first is the period up to the conclusion of the renegotiation of Britain's terms of membership. The second is the period from then through to the end of March. Then you've got April. And then you've got all the polls since the beginning of May. The first thing to note is the internet polls have said it's been 50-50, absolutely consistently all the way through the referendum. Nothing has changed, apparently, according to them. Now, the early phone polls were particularly favourable to remain, but as I'll show you in a moment, there weren't very many of those. Since the renegotiation, essentially, they said, no, no, it's 55-45. But they also say it's only 55-45. One conclusion we should certainly take away from this is that the renegotiation by David Cameron of the EU's terms of membership was a political failure. Cameron hoped to repeat the trick that Howard Wilson pulled off back in 1975, the last time he went through this whole process, go to Brussels, come back with a piece of paper, say, I've renegotiated terms of membership and public opinion shifts very strongly in your favour. The trouble was this time, of course, there were a lot of bu- a bunch of MPs out there who went, uh-uh, no, 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 you've not changed anything. So therefore, Conservative voters did not get the consistent signal from their uh, party leadership that actually they should now be in favour of Remain, despite their scepticism. And therefore, as a result, we are left with a referendum, whichever polls you believe, is, looks as though it's going to be much narrower than was ever intended. Now, of course, in the last week or so, having had a couple of weeks of have Remain finally pulled ahead, has £4,300 worse off finally worked, and that kind of died, we've had, ah, has now the fact that the Leave Perda we into Perda, has the fact that the Leave side now has some ability to control the agenda, has that made a difference? And indeed, we've had a couple of opinion polls which have actually given the Leave side just record leads. Well, the honest truth is, maybe... Maybe not, but we really can't be very sure. Um, before Perja, the polls were still saying 50-50, so that 49 there should say 50. Well, people are saying 50. Now they kind of say, if you take the average of all of the internet polls, since Perda, it's 49 for Remain, 51 for Leave. It's a very small movement. And the truth is we've not had enough in the way of telephone polls since then for us to be sure that actually anything is going on at all. So maybe there's been a bit of movement. Maybe Leave have made a bit of ground. But in truth, that's all we can say. If you believe the internet polls, it's still close. And of course, if you believe the phone polls, even if there has been a 1% movement, the Remain side are still ahead. What, however, is true and has undoubtedly changed the psychology of the campaign is the fact that telephone polls have become more numerous. Back in the early days, this is just simply showing you the number of polls that were done by phone and the number of polls that were done by the internet. As you can see, early on, it was virtually all internet. Just the odd phone poll, which, as I've shown you earlier, showed Remain well ahead. But gradually, the ratio has been changing. Almost undoubtedly, one of the reasons why, for much of late April, May, people were saying, oh, Remain have pulled ahead, is not actually the Remain have pulled ahead. There were just simply more telephone polls being conducted. People just get the headlines. They get a sequence of headlines saying Remain 55, leave 45, or words to that effect. And therefore, the psychology of the campaign is, is affected. Now, whether or not this reveals a nervousness amongst those who pay for opinion polls about the message of the internet polls is an interesting question. And are they therefore willing to spend the more money it costs to do a phone poll as a result? 
It's also true, by the way, that's quite a lot of methodological tweaking going on, to which I don't want to go into detail. Much of it with the effect of pushing Remain up. And it can be argued that the fact that the polls have not moved in recent weeks, despite those methodological tweaks, can be regarded as further evidence that perhaps Leave are doing rather better than people think. Now, to anticipate one question, which, to be honest, I'm happy to do in Q&A, but I'm not going to get into now because it's rather geeky. Which polls do we believe, phone or internet? I think the honest answer is nobody can be sure. There have been various attempts to try to get at the bottom as to why this difference is arising, and nobody, frankly, has fully nailed it down. Uh, Best guidance I can give you, and it is kind of, you know, slightly tangential, is that the phone polls underestimated UKIP in last year's general election. The internet polls overestimated it. So maybe the answer is somewhere in between. OK, I want to move on now to the second part. So the referendum race, well, no race, nobody's moving, right? It's two tortoises trying desperately to make progress and neither succeeding. It's a race where we're not quite sure where the two tortoises are on the field. We keep on having to look around to try to find them, get our torch on and see where they are. But beyond that, what is clear as I hope to show you, and it doesn't matter what kind of polls you're looking at, is that this is a referendum where there are, we are looking at some pretty major social and ideological differences between different sections of the public. And just to kind of give you the headline of what I'm going to say, what we are really seeing here, I think, is a referendum in which Britain decides its attitudes towards globalisation of which the European Union is a primary organisational phenomenon. Okay, let's take it in stages. First of all, who's in favour and who's against? Absolutely consistent finding across all opinion polls, all surveys, is that younger people are inclined to vote to remain, 18 to 24, as you can see here, somewhere between 70 and 75% in recent weeks. The 65 pluses are apparently determined to vote against. Big irony, of course. Those who, like myself, I have to admit, are old enough to have voted in the 1975 referendum have apparently changed their minds. The folk for whom this has always been a part of their life are apparently saying, of course, it's simply part of the furniture. So there's a big, big age difference. Really big. Second is... There's there's another dimension to this. Now, it can be described as a social class difference. So here I'm taking some of the recent opinion polls. I'm using the social grade classification that pollsters regularly use in order to um, differentiate between the kind of middle class and the working class. So as you go from left to right here, you're going from more middle class to more working class. And as you see, as you go from left to right, as you go from more middle class to more working class, so support for Remain is lower and support for Leave is higher. But the truth is, this is not primarily about social class. It's primarily about educational background. University graduates wish to stay, overwhelmingly. Those folk who have little, if anything, in the way of educational qualifications want to get out. And as you can see, if you compare the two diagrams here, the the differences are evident, but they're not as sharp as they are in this data from YouGov. Another data on my educational background show the same thing. So this is a referendum where, above all, There's a difference by age, and there's a difference by educational background. We know from, as Sarah mentioned earlier, many years of social attitudes research that education and age are associated with how socially liberal or how socially conservative you are. This is a referendum, as I'm going to show you, is not about the left-right of politics. It's about the liberal versus the authoritarian end of politics, the second dimension of politics. I should mention, I should perhaps have done a slide on this, the British election study have shown also very neatly that those from an ethnic minority background are also much keener on remaining than are those from a white background. And so that's another uh, division that's there. They're obviously, it's a smaller part of the, politi- public, uh, po- the population that involves. Okay. Um, 
What are the issues that lie behind this referendum? How do people view the consequences of leaving and remaining? Now, the truth is there's an awful lot of opinion polls out there that say, do you trust Boris Johnson? Do you trust David Cameron? Do you trust Nicola Sturgeon? Do you trust whoever, Jeremy Corbyn? To which, of course, the answer is always universally no, and why they bothered to take these polls, I don't quite know. Um, Of course, being a boring social scientist, what I'm interested in much more is, hang on, what's the relationship between people's views about the consequences of independence, i.e. the issues at stake in this referendum, versus uh, the the, the prospects of remaining. And you, Gov, have been very nicely, regularly asking people, pretty regularly, what do you think would happen? And this begins to show you how we are looking at an electorate which is conflicted about this issue. This is a referendum where Remain has arguments that many a voter agree on, and and also the Leave side has arguments that many a voter agrees with. I've roughly ordered them from left to right. So more people think that our influence in the world will be reduced if we left the United Kingdom than if we stayed. More people think that it would be bad for jobs if we left than if we stayed. More people think the economy is going to be worse off if we leave than if we stay. Um, Though we're not quite sure it's going to affect our personal finances. So the economy, together with influence in the world, is undoubtedly a remain issue. Though notice it's only a plurality that think we're going to be worse off, not a majority. Interestingly, the issue of security, and I think this is one of the strategic mistakes the Remain campaign have made, they've always assumed the argument about being more secure inside the EU would work to their advantage. It just doesn't advantage anybody. Most people just say, you must be joking that whether or not we're inside the European Union is going to affect the position on terrorism. Here there are then clearly two arguments that work in Lee's favour. You know, why is the Remain side so upset about the 350 million on Boris's bus? Because it's hitting home. People actually are inclined to believe that there will be more money to spend on the NHS if we leave the European Union. But of course, above all, what a majority of people believe is that immigration will be lower if we leave the European Union. And this, above all, is the crucial motivating factor behind the Remain side. There's one issue here, however, which um, YouGov's data don't quite capture, which are not dissimilar series from ORB uh, capture, um, uh, which is also worth looking at. Again, ORB, they're asking, they ask people, who, which campaign do you think is more likely to be associated with Britain having more influence, a stronger economy, etc.? And again, you can see, for the most part, a fairly similar picture. The economic argument is with Remain. The immigration argument is with Leave. But also notice, if you want to know why every single time Andrea Ledstrom and um, Gisela Stewart and Boris Johnson, virtually every time last night, every time when Michael Gove was on Sky on the Sky programme, said, we want to take back control, there's your answer. People are inclined to believe that if we leave the European Union, they will have more control over their lives. So the issue of sovereignty is also something in England and Wales, at least, I'll come back to this later on, is something that works to the Leave side's advantage. But again, you can see this is an electorate that is conflicted. They think that half of what Remain say is correct and half of what Leave say is correct. Therefore, unsurprisingly perhaps, that they end up somewhere in the middle. Um, However, there, of course, is a counter side to that and and potentially a problem for the Remain side. Is that actually quite a lot of people are going to vote for Remain or say they're going to vote for Remain even though they agree with the Leave side on the immigration issue. Whereas virtually everybody who thinks the economy is going to be worse is voting for Remain. So as you can see that, amongst those people who think the economy will be worse if we leave, 78% say they're going to vote for Remain. All right? Um, But, and on the Leave side, it's not actually they think the economy is going to be better. They're doing this. 
they're going, I think it just won't make any difference. But Leave voters are not really convinced that an economic miracle is going to happen tomorrow if we leave. On immigration, however, Leave voters, absolutely, yep, yep, immigration will be lower. And quite a lot of Remain voters agree with them, but they're going to vote for them despite. So the problem for the Leave side is that, you know, the ec- people's economic perceptions pretty much do kick in. And if, if people have a clear view on the economic consequences, then it's pretty clear what they're going to do. Um, immigration, however, doesn't necessarily make you a Leave voter. And if the Leave side are going to win this referendum, they're going to have to persuade more voters to go with their feelings about immigration than are currently succeeding in doing so. Um, this, of course, is then also to be found in that social division that I was talking about. Younger voters are inclined to think the economy will be worse if we leave. Older voters go, it might just be all right. Those from a university background go, it's going to be worse. Those with no more than a GCSE to their name go, it probably won't make much difference. It might even be slightly better. So that demographic difference is mirrored in a different expectation of what would happen. They don't differ quite so much in their expectations of immigration. Yep, we've got, again, you can see how even amongst those who are inclined towards Remain, there are doubts about immigration. But of course, what really begins to kick in is when you start asking them about whether or not the current level of immigration from the EU is too high or not, then the social division really kicks in. <coughs> Young people much more comfortable with the current level than are older people. Those from university back, no, there's still quite a lot of them out there. going to be nice with fewer, fewer, uh, fewer people coming in, but clearly having a different perspective. These perceptions are also apparently very firmly embedded in the electorate. They've not changed very much. Here's one example. This is YouGov's data on whether or not we will be better or worse. So I've shown you the endpoints already. Um, It's moved a little, but not very much. I mean, basically, the percentage of people who think we'll be worse off has just managed to crawl back up to where it was back last autumn. It's true, however, that the percentage of people who think we're better off has been slipping a little bit, but it's, it's it's not major. Meanwhile, on immigration, we've long felt that immigration would be lower if we left the European Union. And if anything, that perception has grown uh, to a degree. But again, the broad picture, this is a picture and impressions that the electorate seem to have formed months, perhaps years ago, and are thus, perhaps that's the reason to understand why they're proving so difficult to persuade, to change their minds. So what we're then looking at, therefore, is it's seemingly, in many respects, a referendum which, for voters, is on the one hand a section of British society who is stereotypically the young university graduate who probably works alongside somebody from the Czech Republic or Poland or France or whatever. They quite enjoy it. Maybe they're in the city and involved in international markets anyway. And, of course, they've got the linguistic skills that they can actually think about going to Berlin or Barcelona to work themselves. These are the winners of globalisation, or at least those who perceive themselves as the winners. The other end of the spectrum, you have, for example, the hotel porter in Margate, who has very little in the way of educational qualifications. He no longer understands what the cleaning staff in his hotel say to each other. He used to enjoy a Barney at 11 o'clock at coffee break with them. They all speak Polish to each other. He's culturally isolated. He's culturally uncomfortable. And by the way, he's he's not had a pay rise for the last five years. And he reckons he know why that's the case too, because it's too easy for the hotel management to find somebody else to do his job. So I think this is the division that we are seeing. So in part... Supposedly, this is about whether the UK should be a member of an intergovernmental organisation. But at its heart, we are talking in a debate about the kind of society Britain is and should be. And arguably, it's a more profound debate than we have in most general elections. OK, now, there's another division that we should talk about, and it's about geography. 
and that is that Scotland is different. One of the paradoxes of this referendum is that those parts of the UK that 40 years ago were not too keen on the common market are now the ones who are apparently keenest and those who, are, uh, who, who voted most strongly in favour are now the most doubtful. Scotland uh, uh, did not vote very strongly in favour in 1975. It now looks as though, again, it bumps up and down, and it bumps up and down as to whether it's an internet or phone poll or whatever. But on average, Scotland is two to one in favour. Equally, in Northern Ireland, but only voted narrowly in favour of staying back in 1975, looks to be about three to two in favour. Why? Because the debate in Scotland and in Northern Ireland has been framed completely differently from the way it is in England and Wales. In, I've already shown you, across most of the UK, the argument about sovereignty is about we want control back from Brussels. Brussels is regarded psychologically as other. It's regarded to those who wish to leave as a limitation on the UK's sovereignty. But in Scotland... The message from the SNP for the last 25 years, very different from the one from 40 years ago, has been being part of the European Union is one of the ways in which Scotland can realise our ambition to be an independent country. In other words, for the nationalist community in Scotland, being part of the European Union is not a constraint on your nationalist aspirations. It's one of the ways in which they can be realised. And the same is also true for the nationalist community in Northern Ireland, who look as though they're going to vote overwhelmingly in favour. Again, the EU has helped to underpin the Good Friday Agreement. It provides a measure of all Irish governments. Again, it's a framework within which the aspirations of the nationalist community in Northern Ireland look as though they're more likely to be realised. Therefore, we get this very different argument about sovereignty in these two parts of the UK. So we've got a geographical divide. We, of course, also got a major political divide. The truth is this referendum is darned awkward for every UK political party apart from UKIP. Pretty much every UKIP voter will indeed vote to leave, though. You know, you can find the odd one in the opinion poll. Perhaps they like Nigel Farage, but maybe they like uh, Mr Juncker as well. You know, there are apparently a few people out there like that. Um, Conservative voters, on average in the opinion polls, basically divided 50-50. This is Cameron's ultimate failure. He's been unable to pull his party be behind him. He is, in many respects, the leader of the opposition now because he's leading a coalition of only about one in four are actually conservative voters. But you can also see Labour's problem. OK, they're about two to one in favour. But there's about a third of Labour voters, more at the working class end of Labour's vote, who are going, no. <coughs> And even the SNP in Scotland, again, it's only about two to one in favour. There's a minority of nationalists who go, hang on, why are we after independence and then apparently willing to sell our sovereignty uh, to Brussels? All leaders struggle to get their voters on side. This is a di now, we've known that Europe has long been disruptive for our parties in terms of parliamentary level. This is also proving very disruptive at the voter level as well. And, you know, they, all of them are going to have quite both uh, uh, repairing to do afterwards. Okay, now let me move towards the end and the prospects for the next two weeks. Now, you know, if I was rich, um, uh, I would get a pound for every time a journalist round me up and said, how many don't knows are there and what are they going to do? <laughs> to which I always give the geekish answer, well, it depends on how you ask the question as to how many people out there don't know. Because, of course, the truth is the world is not divided into two binary groups, decided and undecided. It's a spectrum upon which we are all of us around. Doctor, some of you in this room are clear what you're going to do. Some of you say, well, I probably know what I'm going to do, but I'm not quite sure. And there may be others of you who are still wondering you're going to get enlightenment today, and good luck to you. Um, so, um, therefore, actually, the truth is the number of don't knows um, often varies quite strongly. And it's, of course, also fallacious to believe that everybody who tells a pollster now that they're going to remain or leave are going to do that. I mean, after all, Sarah Wollaston's just told us she certainly changed her mind, and I'm sure she's not unique in that position. 
Um, the truth is that campaigns can win or lost not simply by getting the undecided, who are more likely to stay at home anyway at the end of the day, um, than uh, by conversion. But anyway, for what it's worth, here's ICM who have done most polling. It looks as though gradually the number of don't knows has been going down. They're the, one, they're the black line there. Though I should warn you, and this again, this is why I say it depends on how you ask the question, but some of the tweaks ICM have introduced into their data, not least beginning to weight the data by reported propensity of voting, is also responsible for some of that decline on the right-hand side. Perhaps slightly more robust is data from Comres and from Ipsos Mori, which tend to ask people, look, you know, have you definitely decided what you're going to do or might you change your mind? And the top folk at the top here are the ones who have definitely decided. And as you can see, it looks as though gradually as we've been going along that fewer people say they might change their mind, but still enough of them potentially to. And then, of course, it still leaves the question of whether or not people actually know they've made up their mind. Who knows? I'm sure Sarah Wollaston sure had, had definitely made her mind up a few weeks ago and then discovered she hadn't made up her mind um, after all. Um, I also get asked frequently, so who are the undecided? Which is the crucial group of people that we have to convince? Well, the answer is usually women, and I'm sorry to engage in social stereotypes here, but the truth is, in virtually every opinion poll about politics, you always get more women who say, don't know. Now, maybe they're just being more honest than men. I don't know, but it's, it's there. And you can gain see it here. I mean, there are certainly more women than men who say they don't know. But, for example, when it comes by age, which is as with the big social divide, there's no, I mean, the, the undecideds are equally common in the two groups. So it's not obvious and there is, by the way, there's no gender gap in attitudes towards the EU. So there's no obvious potential advantage here to one side or the other in terms of the composition of the undecided. Whatever you can do, and what some pollsters do, and sometimes they include it in the numbers and sometimes they don't, is to say to the undecided, Look, come on, I'm going to put you up against a wall, and I'm going to put a gun to your head, and you're going to tell me whether or not actually, secretly, you're more of a remain or more of a leave. And when they do that, they do tend to find rather more people say, well, actually, I'm probably more likely to vote Remain than to leave. But it's not dramatic. It's about 30% of them to 20%. The other 50% say, look, you can fire your gun, and I'm still not going to tell you. Um, And um, it's also true, as I suggested earlier, this is a group of people who, in aggregate, are less likely to go to the party station anyway. So the actual advantage to Remain of this may be there, but it may not be dramatic. But certainly that's one reason why the Remain side might think that towards the end they might make a bit of progress in the opinion polls. On the other hand, of course, there is the crucial question of who actually is going to make it to the opinion polls, uh, to, to, to the polling station. Um, and consistent finding from the opinion polls is that those who say they are going to leave are more likely to say that they will turn out to vote than are those who say they remain. And if you're wondering why that number is lower than both those numbers, it's because the folk who can't, aren't remain or leavers are indeed, as I've already suggested, the ones who say uh, they're unlikely to turn out and vote. So about three-quarters of leave voters say, I'm absolutely certain to vote, whereas the figure for remain voters is only about 70% uh, percent or so. Um, Looks as though from some further analysis I've done, this is almost undoubtedly simply a consequence of the difference in the age profile of the two groups. Certainly, one data set I had access to, very kindly from YouGov, um, you actually begin to model the data and in order to try to model who is a, somebody who's certain to vote or not. Age is it, and once you've got age into your statistical model, adding whether or not they're a remain or a leave voter doesn't make any difference. So almost undoubtedly, it's simply the, the uh, social profile of the remain vote. It's one of the, and there aren't many iron rules in political science, but one of the iron rules of political science is it doesn't matter what's the election, what's the referendum, younger voters are less likely to vote. And that's just simply the problem the Remain side have to live with. There's, of course, one other consideration that certainly is much talked about, and there's been various attempts to look at this by getting at the difference between the outcome of referendums, particularly referendums about major constitutional change and, uh, the actual, um, and what the opinion polls were saying beforehand. And there's a tendency, it's a tendency, it's not 100% deterministic, that the opinion polls seem to some degree to overestimate the appetite for change. 
certainly saw that in the Scottish independence referendum, although the Yes side made a lot of progress in late August, early September. In the last week of the campaign, the later the opinion poll, the lower the level of support for independence. So therefore, perhaps a risk-averse electorate will indeed draw back in the end from whatever proclivities they have to vote to leave and move towards the main side. And you can see some reason why that might be the case. Although, you know, it's not overwhelming. So here are, YouGov very nicely asked people how risky or safe do you think it is to remain inside the EU, how risky or safe it is to leave. More people think that leave is, is risky than think remaining is risky, but it's not overwhelming. So maybe there'll be a bit of movement on this basis, but again, maybe the Remain side would be wise not to bank too heavily on it. OK, so this is really just what, all, all what I've said. Um, this has been a referendum campaign which has been extraordinarily stable, even as voters have gradually been making up their minds and gradually firming up their views, and the dump, number of don't knows has been diminishing. We're still looking at this apparently incredibly flat line with just a question mark about what's happened in the last week or so. And it's stable around somewhere not very far away from 50-50. We're just not quite sure how close to 50-50 it is. But despite that uncertainty, there's, and whatever is the outcome, one key thing to understand about this referendum, and it, and it marks it out from the 1975 referendum where there were no arguments about immigration. This, and it's before the days of globalisation, this is a referendum in which we are playing out a major social division between what we might regard as the winners and losers from the globalisation process. And in so doing, we are fracturing the support bases of all of our political parties in the UK. So it's a real challenge also to the political uh, system of the UK. We may, may gain little amongst the undecided and perhaps some risk aversion, but Leave voters are committed to going to the polls. But in the end, I think this referendum is going to be settled by the answer, is it the economy or immigration? That, in the end, it seems for most voters, is the crucial question.